picture then, if you will, that I'm not just taking a blue pencil, but an actual chisel, and seeing if these tablets of stone could possibly stand a bit of an update for our time. Numbers one and two actually don't have anything to do with ethics at all. They are injunctions. They remind or instruct you that I am the Lord thy God, that thou shalt have no other gods before me, and they forbid the making of graven images. Uh, the commandment against the making of graven images, or images of God, is very upsetting to many Catholics who often leave this bit of the commandment out, because where would Christian art and devotional painting be if you couldn't make impressive images of God, his son, his son's mother. Then we are rather sternly ordered uh, not to take the name of this God in vain. And it's then added rather superfluously that you won't be held guiltless if you do take the name of this Lord in vain. Well, no one has ever worked out exactly how to obey this commandment. Is it taking the Lord's name in vain to shout, God is great, while blowing yourself up and killing innocent people? Some say it's obedience to the law of God. When I say God knows, I really mean I think that nobody knows. It's usually wise when promulgating eternal laws to be clear about what you mean. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Bearing in mind that a god is a magical anthropomorphic immortal, having miraculous powers and human attributes, but being able to survive the death of his own body, it is fair to say that nearly every Christian is in violation of this very first commandment. And Catholics very often fashion that other god out of silver or gold. Consider the second commandment. Thou shalt not erect any graven images. Is this really the second most important thing <laughs> upon which to admonish all future generations of human beings? I mean, is, this, is this as good as it gets ethically and spiritually? I mean, you remember the Muslims who rioted by the hundreds of thousands over cartoons. What got them so riled up? Well, this is it, the second commandment. Now, was all that pious mayhem, the burning of embassies, the killing of nuns, was all of that some kind of great flowering of, of spiritual and ethical intelligence? Or was it egregious medieval stupidity? Well, come to think of it, it was egregious medieval stupidity. <laughs> the truth is that almost any precept we would put in place of the second commandment would improve the wisdom of the Bible. How about don't mistreat children? How about don't pretend to know things you do not know? Or what about just try not to deep fry all of your food? <laughs> could, could we live with the resulting proliferation of graven images? I think we would manage somehow. Thou shalt make unto thee Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Second clause. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the inequity of the fathers unto the children of the third and fourth generations of them that hate me and showing mercy to the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. This is the stick in the carrot again. Believe our ridiculous nonsense or else. That's the law of Abrahamic religion. If you're Jewish, you would interpret this to mean that you're supposed to obey all 10 commandments, including the fourth one. Most Americans would interpret this to mean that you're not supposed to worship false gods. But how can you tell which ones are the false ones? Everyone who has a belief in a god thinks everyone else's pantheon as the false ones, right? But it doesn't tell you that you're not supposed to worship these renderings. It tells you you're not allowed to create them at all. 
regardless whether you intended to worship them or not. Thou shalt not make any engraving of any, or any likeness in any medium of anything that is in heaven and earth. Now, presumably, they're only talking about recognizable things like animals or plants or, or trees or what have you. In which case, abstract art is permissible only by omission. And what this is saying is it is against God's law to draw a picture or paint or sculpt or create any likeness of anything, any living thing, at least, if not other things like chariots and helmets and so on, perhaps even maps. That means that any artistic rendering of any kind is forbidden. That is what it says, and it's obviously what it means, but virtually no one obeys this particular commandment. Only the most extreme barking lunatics could, and I only ever met one who did. Otherwise, the only way to revere this is to interpret it to mean what it does not say, which is a common Christian tradition. In fact, the 11th commandment, given soon after these, in the same chapter, says, Thou shalt not make other gods besides me neither of silver nor gold. Amusingly, there's an implied admission that man made God in his own image. But more than that, it also means that this commandment is, this commandment is not limited to gods. You're not, this uh, prohibits any artistic depiction of anything at all. Now, why is that? Because gods are jealous. They don't want you to worship other gods, but they don't want you to become like gods yourselves. In the earliest legends, the gods created humanity out of clay figurines into which they breathed the breath of life. In the ancient Semitic traditions or, or the ancient Jewish magic, this is called a golem spell. God doesn't want you to create things that might become infused with a spirit and come alive. And need I point out that if the old Jewish god Jehovah actually existed and was the only god who ever existed, then it would not be possible for him to be jealous of any other god. <laughs> Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Is that really a moral principle we should be living by? At the time when that was written down, the Jews were polytheists, or had recently changed from polytheism. They believed that lots of gods existed, and they were under very strict instructions to worship only one of them, the jealous god. <laughs> Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. A moral principle to live by. Don't make any graven images. <laughs> Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Are there better things to worry about? <laughs> Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who taketh his name in vain. Jesus Christ, what can I say about all the goddamn blasphemers that broke that commandment? <laughs> Did I just break it? I mean, I could have said everything I just said as a prayer, and all these words would have been literally applicable. Uh, does America have any legal prohibitions against this? Did we ever? I mean, broadcasters can say this on public airways. Yet the Bible would have us to believe that saying Jesus is worse than saying any other shit. <laughs> what about the Founding Fathers? They spoke very irreverently. They didn't have any particular uh, concern or consideration or reverence for the names of God or Jesus. Uh, and they spoke of Christianity in very derogative terms. But the Founding Fathers never said fuck, did they? It's not just about the Judeo-Christian God either. In a later commandment, you are forbidden to say the name of any other God for any reason at all. If you're not afraid of the power of the words and casually repeat mystic incantations without trepidation and noticeably without effect, then you sort of nullify the expected magic and that's what this is really all about. Religion is all about the power of pretend. It is literally make-believe. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, the Christians who want this uh, inscribed in courtrooms and in schoolrooms would end up taking Saturday off rather than Sunday because this uh, program of commandments is actually a program for the establishment of a fundamentalist Jewish state. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
You may be familiar with the passage in Numbers 15.32, which I'll read to you. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward, because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall surely be put to death, and the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And the congregation brought him without the camp, and stoned him with stones, and he died, as the Lord commanded Moses. What a wonderful moral God! <laughs> Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. <laughs> For the sake of time, I will skip all of the arguments pertaining to the bewildering inanity of the six-day creation and focus only on the Sabbath. When is it? Most Americans forget, and the evening and the morning was the seventh day. Did you have a question? Okay. <laughs> and the evening and the morning was the seventh day. And according to the original Jewish tradition, that was Friday evening to Saturday night. But whether it is Saturday or Sunday, according to the Judeo-Christian principles detailed in the book of Numbers, what is the penalty for working on weekends? Death. Same penalty for damn near everything. Is that a capital felony today? Um, not only does America have no legal prohibitions against working on weekends, not even Jesus obeyed this particular commandment. He said he came to fulfill the law, and he warned his followers that they had, keep, they had better keep every jot and tittle of all those other commandments laid down by Mosaic law, including all that nasty insanity in Leviticus. And he said that if you, if you break any of those commandments, you will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But... He said that his followers could freely ignore the fourth commandment. Consequently, all the other commandments in this set, at least, are repeated multiple times each throughout the New Testament, but the fourth commandment is not repeated even once. Oh, and Jesus, Jesus also said you didn't have to wash your hands before you eat. That was a moat of Hebrew wisdom he chose to ignore because he didn't believe in natural pathogens. And yet, today, federal regulations require employees to wash their hands, and for the longest time, you couldn't buy alcohol on a Sunday in Texas because Christians thought that was the Sabbath. They don't listen to their Christ, do they? Commandment number five enjoins that thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother, which seems reasonable enough. It's an interesting commandment because when given in full, it says that if you do so, you will have a longer tenure of the land that's been promised to you. It's one of the few commandments that comes with, an, with a, an inducement, if you will. It even seems to suggest that you should honor your father and mother because you expect a legacy from them. Honor thy father and thy mother. That's rather a good one. <laughs> but now listen to Jesus. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, Yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 26. Honor thy father and thy mother. Now, this is another one of the nice ones, right? Unless you compare it to the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus says, do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I come not to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me 
is not worthy of me. And if you think that's out of context or uncharacteristic of the man Jesus, check out the Gospel of Luke 14.26. Whoever comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother and his brothers and his sisters and his wife and his children and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I think it's funny that so many Christian organizations describe themselves as being family-oriented when it's so obvious that Jesus was clearly not. Of course, 1 John 3.15 says, Anyone who hates his, mother, his, hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Revelation 21.8 says, But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. Remember that, Ray Comfort. <laughs> Their part will be in the, fire, in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So Jesus says to love the Jews, all, love other Jews as yourself. But he also says you're supposed to hate yourself and your brother. And anybody who hates his brother is a murderer who's going to die in the lake of fire. And you have to pick up your cross to follow Jesus, and you will not get eternal life regardless of what Jesus said elsewhere. <laughs> so if it seems that this is another one of those hundreds of nonsensical contradictions found throughout the Bible, just remember what your pastors told you. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. So this is not a contradiction. This is not a contradiction. Getting back to the topic, we haven't read the whole commandment. It goes on to say, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And now let's forget for a moment that according to this story, and it is just a story, even rabbinical scholars now admit that the Exodus was not an actual historic event. Let's forget that God's, God promised to his chosen people land that already belonged to someone else. Uh, both the Jewish and Christian versions of God are apparently ethnocentric racists. Jesus himself was Jewish and he denied his lessons and his blessings to those of other races who he criticized comparing them to dogs. Much the same with his alleged father Jehovah who sent an angel into the promised land to drive out a half a dozen tribes who already lived there in favor of his chosen people. This commandment could be read as, honor your father and thy mother so that you will live a long life. Because remember, this was a culture that permitted parents to murder disobedient children. So you'd better show some respect. Because it was legal for fathers to say, I brought you into this world, I'll take you out, make another one look just like you. <laughs> 